Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to another true crime video. So the case that I have for you guys today involves a disappearance that I am totally baffled on and I'm really looking forward to hearing all of your guys' thoughts on this one. But before we get into it, I need to say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com. The holiday season is the perfect time to buy that last thing that you've had your eye on for a while and let me tell you, GlassesUSA.com has the best deals for you. GlassesUSA.com is one of the biggest eyewear retailers in the U.S., offering over 10,000 prescription eyeglasses and sunglasses at up to 70% off of retail prices, starting at only $39. You know what's even better than that is that this holiday season, GlassesUSA.com has so many exclusive offers that you can't find anywhere else. Plus, if you have your FSA or HSA dollars that you've been saving all year, then use them ASAP and you'll basically get your pair of glasses for free. When it comes to buying glasses and shopping online, it's so much fun, but sometimes it can be a bit overwhelming. You have so many options and sometimes it can be hard to find exactly what pair of glasses are right for you, but I loved my experience shopping online with GlassesUSA.com because they they have this amazing tool that helps you find the perfect pair. With their virtual try-on tool, you can see just how each pair of glasses will look on you before spending the money to buy them. The glasses that I'm wearing right now are with one of their home brands, Muse. I love these glasses. They're my favorite pair to wear when I'm working on the computer because of their blue light blocking coating. I also have two pairs of Amelia E glasses, which are another of my favorite brands. It's one of their home brands as well. I have these brown pair. And these ones are nice for every day. Um, they match pretty much any outfit that I can wear. But because I love these glasses so much, I have another in the color black. So these are another of my favorite pair to wear just every day. These ones are good for going to school, going to work, things like that. Again, I love the classic colors because they match with pretty much everything. And then I also have a pair of these Ray-Ban sunglasses. These are my favorite for just driving around outside or hiking or any time that I'm going to be in the sun. I also love that shopping online at GlassesUSA.com is a risk-free shopping experience. You can get free shipping on all orders and you can enjoy a 100% money-back guarantee within 14 days. So make sure you use my link down below and head to GlassesUSA.com to check out their holiday offers. Don't forget to use your FSA or HSA dollars before they expire at the end of the year. And if you have the Klarna app, then you can buy now and pay later. So again, make sure you click the links at the top of my description box to see all of the details that GlassesUSA.com has to offer. Thank you again so much to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring today's video. And because the reflection in my glasses can be bothersome to some people, I will be removing the glasses for the remainder of this video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the bizarre disappearance of Marshall Iwasha. Marshall Iwasha was born on January 3rd, 1993 in Lethbridge, Alberta, Canada to parents Tammy Johnson and Perry Iwasha, and he had an older sister named Paige. Now, Paige described that Perry had not been involved in their lives for the previous 10 years before Marshall's disappearance, so it seemed that it was mostly Marshall, Tammy, and Paige growing up. Paige describes her brother Marshall as being quiet, gentle, reserved, and kind. Paige said that while she was much more of the assertive, dominating personality of the family, Marshall was always just so kind towards everyone in his life. He was so easygoing that there was one time where he found an injured bird on the side of the road who was stuck in a fence and he pulled over and he was able to get the bird free because he was just able to remain calm and level-headed. In another instance, he had just gotten a new truck and he let his sister borrow it and pretty much right away, she hit a bird and cracked the windshield but that didn't make him upset. He remained calm and he said, you know what? It's okay. Growing up, Marshall enjoyed playing football and rugby, though he did quit at a certain point because he decided that he no longer liked hitting other people. He didn't mind other people hitting him, but he didn't like hurting anybody else. 
He also wanted to be outdoors any chance he got. He loved camping with his friends and family. He enjoyed hiking and swimming in the lake. Him and Paige always enjoyed going on trips together to Hawaii and things like that. Throughout elementary school, Marshall always kept a small group of friends who he stayed in contact with pretty much his entire life. After he graduated high school, Marshall became more interested in fitness and bodybuilding. Because of this, he made a lot of new friends within the fitness circle and built a good network of friends through the gym. That, and he also kept close contact with his friends through high school as well. While in high school, Marshall worked at a local grocery store to make money. After graduating, he started working more of the physical labor jobs. He worked in the gas industry, working the power lines, and things like that. However, shortly after this, Marshall decided that he wanted a job in technology, so he enrolled in the IT program for software development at the Southern Alberta University of Technology for the fall and spring of 2018 and 2019. Because of this, he moved away from his home in Lethbridge and moved to Calgary. While there, Paige eventually moved to Hawaii about six years before Marshall went missing. About every six months, Paige would return back to Canada for about a week during the summer to visit with her family. Then, around every Christmas, Marshall would go to Hawaii to visit her. There, the two would celebrate their birthdays together because they were only a week apart. After moving, Marshall and Paige maintained contact by texting or calling at least once a week. However, after school started, this contact dropped off a little bit. This was totally understandable to everybody because he was so busy with school and everything else that was going on. So, it definitely was understandable that even though they usually contacted each other once a week, that maybe it dropped down a little bit. Now, Marshall was supposed to be enrolled back in school in the fall of 2019, but it turned out that he hadn't actually enrolled for that semester. He did complete his fall of 2018 semester and his spring of 2019 semester, but he didn't return back for the fall of 2019. During the summer of 2019, Paige had been back in Canada visiting her family for a couple of weeks for a family reunion. While visiting, her and the rest of the family were all under the impression that Marshall was going to be going back to school that fall. But no one really knew for sure exactly what he was doing. When he was asked about school, he would say something vague like, people in my field don't actually need a degree, it's more about who you know and your experience. So it seemed that maybe he didn't want to be in school anymore and that maybe he wanted to go back to working full time, but he never really said whether or not he was going back to school or not, so people kind of assumed that he was and that, you know, maybe he was having second thoughts, but they weren't exactly sure. Nobody in his family knew for sure exactly what his intentions were. His family didn't really want to pry though because they knew that Marshall was a very private person and so they figured that whether he was going to go back to working or whether he was going to go back to school, he knew what he was doing. So, his family sort of just left it at that. I also do want to mention that in the two months before Marshall's disappearance, Paige said that it was getting a bit harder to get into contact with Marshall. Overall, when Paige went to Hawaii, his whole family said that Marshall became a little bit more distant with everybody. But him and Paige would be in contact at least once a week until that two months, like I said. She said that there was times that it would take him weeks to reply, so she wondered if maybe he was avoiding her for whatever reason. So, this is something that she noticed about his behavior that was a little bit different in the two months before he went missing. But overall, once again, he was an introvert. He wasn't constantly contacting anybody. So, she thought that maybe there was a reason behind it. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe it was just something that he was going through or maybe that's just how it was. Now, Marshall and Paige also shared a storage unit together where they kept a bunch of their extra stuff. They both had a bunch of random things in there like Christmas decorations, books, family memorabilia, camping stuff, and things like that. When Paige left back for Hawaii in August of 2019, she left behind some items for Marshall to put into the storage unit, which he did soon after. So now fast forwarding to November of 2019. 
Marshall's mother had planned on meeting him in Calgary, which is about a two-hour drive from Lethbridge for a visit. But because Marshall still had some items that he needed to put in his storage unit, which was by his mother's house, Marshall said that he would make the drive to his mom instead in Lethbridge since he'd be there anyways. So he left to visit his mom on the evening of November 17th, 2019. During that day, he had been cleaning up his apartment, according to his sister. It just looked like he had just got done cleaning when she went to go see his apartment after he disappeared. His roommates also said that he spent the whole day cleaning, doing laundry, and things like that, just sort of tidying up the place before he left that evening to go visit his mother. Then he visited with his mother for about an hour and a half, and during this time, he helped her fix some things on her computer. By 11 p.m. that night, Marshall said his goodbyes to his mother, and he said that he would be heading back to Calgary. Now, of course, because it was kind of late, his mom offered for him to stay there for the night, and of course, she wanted to spend more time with him, but she also didn't want him driving that late at night. But he declined and said that he actually needed to stop at the storage unit that night and then get back to Calgary that same night. His storage unit was located in the Northside Industrial Area between Sharing and Churchill, about 15 minutes away from his mother's house. According to his mother, Tammy, during their visit, nothing seemed off with Marshall. He was his normal, chill, reserved, calm self. If there was something bothering him or if he was under some sort of stress, he didn't mention it to her. After leaving his mother's house, he arrived to the storage unit at around 11.30 p.m. that night after the facility had closed for the night. That same night, he tried gaining access to the storage unit using his code several times. According to the logs from that night, it showed that he tried over and over and over again all in a row at first, and then he took a break before trying to enter again. Paige said that she doesn't think that Marshall knew that the storage unit was locked at that point, when they originally got their storage unit, they did have 24-hour access, but at some point after they got it, the owners changed the hours so that you can only access it during certain hours, but they didn't know about that change until this day when Marshall couldn't get in. Now, if you've ever had a storage unit before, I have. I don't know if it's the same for everybody or if it's just with, you know, my storage unit and how Marshall's worked, but you get your own individual code to access the facility where the storage unit is located. So if you or a loved one uses your code to get into the storage unit, it's linked back to your personal code. So we know for a fact that it was Marshall trying to gain access to the storage unit with his own code because him and Paige were the only ones who had access to that code and we know that Paige wasn't the one trying to do it. So we know it had to have been Marshall. Either way, Marshall was very determined to gain access to the storage unit. So after several attempts, he was finally finally able to gain access at 6 a.m. on Monday, November 18th, when the facility opened for the day. After gaining access to the locker, he stayed there for about an hour and a half and left at around 8.30. After this, unfortunately, this is the very last time anybody has heard from Marshall. Also, unfortunately, by the time the family knew that Marshall was missing, the security video at the storage unit had been erased, so we don't know exactly what he was doing at the facility. We don't know if anybody was with him or, you know, if he stayed the night at the storage unit or where he stayed the night. All we know is that he didn't stay the night at his mother's house and obviously he waited all night to be able to gain access to his storage unit. We don't know what he took, if anything, or if he put stuff in there. We really don't know anything other than the logs that show he was there and when he left. We also don't know why he chose to spend the night anywhere other than his mother's house. Like I said, if he couldn't gain access all night, clearly he either slept in his car or somewhere nearby, but his mother's house was only 15 minutes away. So if he needed to wait until exactly 6 a.m. to get into the storage unit, he could have slept at his mother's house that night and then just woken up really early and gotten in as soon as he could. 
but it seems that he didn't do that and we don't know why. Paige did say that it's pretty normal for Marshall to be this determined. Like, if he couldn't get in, it's totally normal that he would wait until he was able to and, you know, get in there right away. He thought, you know, I drove all the way here. I'm not going to return back without my stuff or without putting my stuff in the storage unit or without, you know, doing exactly what I need to do. But again, we don't know why he didn't just stay at his mother's house that night. Now, like I said, Marshall and Paige hadn't been keeping as much contact as they normally did for the past few months. However, in the days after the 17th, Paige realized that she hadn't been contacted by Marshall in quite a while. His phone had actually been disconnected, but this actually wasn't too concerning for him because he often let his phone run out of minutes. There were times that he just didn't pay for his cell phone bill, so there would be a few months at a time where it was shut off and, you know, he didn't have any minutes on his phone and he was totally fine with it. So at this point, she tried contacting him via email, which again was a normal thing. If she realized his phone was out of minutes, she would just email him, but he also was not answering any of the emails. So she contacted his mother to see if she had heard from him and she hadn't. So she thought at this point that maybe he was contacting his friends via Snapchat. So once again, she contacted his friends to see if any of them had heard from him, but they also hadn't. Now, this was very unusual for Marshall because he would at least check in with somebody at some point but he wasn't contacting anybody via any means. Now, after the visit with Marshall and his mother, on November 22nd, 2019, Tammy actually went to Hawaii to visit with Paige. While there, however, they received a very concerning call from the authorities. So, a group of hikers actually discovered Marshall's dark blue 2009 GMC Sierra at the trailhead of a trail in a rural area just north of Pemberton, British Columbia, which is around a 12 to 16 hour drive away from Lethbridge. In the call, Tammy reports that the authorities literally said that the hikers found his truck torched. It had been burned so badly that it was basically unrecognizable. The area that the truck was found in was the trailhead for Brian Waddington Hut. This is a deep backwooded area in a very rural forested area. Where the trailhead is, you have to drive up some very rough terrain for about 15 to 20 kilometers away from the main road. You need a four-wheel drive just to get through this terrain because there's areas of slick mud, gravel, boulders, potholes, and creeks. You also can't use your GPS to get there because there's no cell service. Then, from the trailhead, you have to hike for about two to three hours before getting to the actual hut. Then, when you arrive to the hut, you actually have to register ahead of time to be able to stay the night at the hut. So, there were hikers there who were on their way to the hut who happened to see Marshall's burnt out truck. So, because of where the truck was found, police checked the logs for the Brian Waddington hut to see if he had registered there, and they found out that not only was he not registered to stay there that night, but he had never been to this hut before in general. So, it was totally random that his truck was even there. Paige said that he would never go camping or hiking by himself, especially to a trail in an area that he's never been to before. He had absolutely no ties to British Columbia, so there definitely was not a reason for him to be visiting there, especially in such a specific remote area. I also want to mention that in the months before Marshall's disappearance, he told his family that he was actually having trouble with his four-wheel drive on his truck. So, it's just another thing that made this apparent decision to drive through this rough terrain to this random trailhead even more strange. The other strange thing was that a bunch of Marshall's personal belongings were scattered all around the truck. These belongings included three smashed cell phones, all which belonged to Marshall. I believe they were old cell phones that Marshall used. They weren't current. They also found a bunch of clothing everywhere, an Xbox, a PlayStation, and his expired passport. At first, it was thought that the Xbox and the PlayStation both belonged to Marshall. 
However, after Paige went to his apartment, she saw that his Xbox and PlayStation were still there. So it's no longer thought that these gaming consoles actually belonged to Marshall. Instead, it seems that they belong to somebody else. They also found that his backpack, his laptop, his contact lenses, contact solution, his wallet, as well as his current cell phone were all missing from the truck. I do want to mention that it's not strange that these old cell phones were in his truck. He would often get used cell phones from somebody else to use, somebody who already paid off the phone, and it was also common that he would break his cell phone very easily and just have to get a new one. So the fact that there were old, broken, or smashed phones in his car was not a surprise to his family. Sometimes he just threw random stuff in his glove box and forgot about it. I have the same thing with my car. There's so many random things just in the trunk or in the glove box or in the car that mean absolutely nothing. If I ever went missing and they were trying to examine these items in my car, they would have to realize that they mean absolutely nothing because there's just random stuff everywhere. So I kind of have the same thing. So I totally understand that there's these random cell phones in his truck that don't actually really mean anything. His family knew what phone he was using currently at that time and they knew that it wasn't there. So that was the more important thing that his current cell phone that he currently used was missing from the truck. After the hikers had originally reported this truck, now I do want to sort of say how they called because again, we know there was no cell service. So as they were hiking, they stumbled upon this truck and then they actually had to leave and go hike back to where they had cell service call the police, and then go back about their business. But either way, after receiving the call, the RCMP spent two days trying to get to the site. It was so difficult to access the site where the truck was that one of the police vehicles was actually damaged while trying to access it. Now, the original people who found the truck took pictures of the scene because obviously they were very concerned when they saw this burnt up truck. They knew that they may have stumbled upon a crime scene or something that just looked very unusual. So they took pictures of it. But by the time police got to the area, the scene was actually different. According to Tammy and Paige in the photos that police took, it looked like some of the items that were scattered around his truck had been moved. So one example was that the cell phones that were found were thrown all around in the original photos, but in the second photos, it looked like these two cell phones were placed neatly next to one another. They also found that the steering column from the truck had also been removed. The RCMP, or the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, they said that they did not remove it, so it's unknown who took it from the truck. So, it's not known whether these items were moved or tampered with by the person who may be involved in this case, or if it was just nosy tourists who saw the scene and started messing around with the items or reorganizing them for whatever reason. Again, we know that there were two full days of this truck and the items just sitting there while the police were trying to gain access to the site, so it's really not known what could have happened to these items within those two days. They did ask members of the public to come forward if they were in that area on those days to see if anybody had inadvertently moved any of the items on accident or anything like that, but as far as we know, nobody has come forward with that information. Police also said that while they did examine the truck at the actual scene, they haven't been able to move the truck to a different location, such as their labs, due to the conditions. They're not able to tow the truck away because of the terrain that they would have to transverse to get the truck out of there. I guess they couldn't airlift it, anything like that. So I believe that truck is still there to this day. The family of Marshall also said that they're not happy with the way this scene was investigated. The RCMP has preserved many of the items that they found on the scene, but none of them have been tested. 
They don't know if there's any DNA found at the scene, whether it be in the truck or on any of the items. They don't know if there's fingerprint on any of the items or in the truck. All of these different items had been collected, but they're pretty much just sitting there and they're not being tested. In response to this, the RCMP has said that they cannot test DNA in their crime labs until they have reasonable grounds to believe that a DNA designated criminal offense has been committed and they've said that they just don't have evidence of that at this time. They have stated that Marshall's disappearance is suspicious, but they can't be confident that criminal activity was involved at this time. They have monitored his social media, his bank accounts, his cell phone, and all that, but they found no activity on anything since November 15th. They've also said that they've checked surveillance cameras on all of the possible routes that he could have taken from Lethbridge to the area that his truck was found, but they haven't seen him in any of these videos either. They also checked his bank accounts and along all of the possible routes that he could have taken to see if he got gas at any point during his trip, and they found absolutely nothing. Even if he did pay for this gas in cash and it wasn't on his bank statements, he has very distinctive tattoos and very distinctive hair. So it's very strange that if he did stop to get gas, that nobody would come forward to say that they saw him or that he wasn't seen on any surveillance video anywhere. This is one of the biggest questions in this case is how did he drive so far without stopping for gas? Like I said, it would have been about a 12-hour drive from Lethbridge to Pemberton, but after that, it can take as many as two to three hours just to get to the spot where his truck was found because, you know, you have to drive very slow, there's very rough terrain. I've driven on roads like this before. You're literally driving like 10 to 20 miles per hour for like two hours just to get to where you need to be. So he would have needed to get gas at some point at least once, if not twice. So that is a very, very strange thing about this entire case. Now, the RCMP has said that they've searched the area with cadaver dogs. They brought out a search and rescue team to search. They used ATVs as well as a helicopter to search for the area, but they found nothing. The RCMP also said that they worked with a fire investigator to see how the fire was started and to see if they could find its origin. All I've seen stated about this is that they know accelerant must have been used to cause such damage, but otherwise, I wasn't able to find out any more information about what they found. We do know that the police are not sharing a lot of information with the public. They're also not sharing a lot of information with the family. The family is very frustrated at their lack of knowledge and the police aren't really budging with giving them anything more. I do understand wanting to protect the integrity of the investigation so that you know, if someone has guilt knowledge, they know that they didn't get it from the press or the family or anywhere else. They know that they have to have that because nobody else knows about it. But at the same time, I feel like we need a little bit more. If they have more, we need a little bit of it just to see if anybody out there remembers something that maybe they didn't realize was connected to this case, but if the police released the information, maybe they could make that connection and come forward. I don't know, but I do think that after four years of no answers, we need a little bit of something. So at this point, there are multiple theories as to what could have happened. First, police believe that it's possible that maybe he left on his own accord. They stated, quote, in examining Iwasha's personal affairs in the months leading up to his disappearance, including interviews with close friends as well as his financial, medical, and social media activity, there's evidence to suggest that he was experiencing stress in his life and had become withdrawn. I will also mention that his family did not find out about him not re-enrolling in school until after his disappearance, so clearly that was something that was going on, something that he didn't want his family to know about. So with this statement, I don't know if they're suggesting that, you know, his mental state is what caused him to want to leave his life or take his life, but to me, that's what it seems like they're trying to say. But his family just does not understand why he would have driven his truck to that specific area. 
why he would have set his truck on fire. He has no connections to British Columbia or anywhere where the truck was found. He didn't take cash out of his account to leave. He didn't use his credit card or his debit card. He didn't contact anybody, and there hasn't been any activity on any of his phones or any of his social media accounts. So I will say that those things about this case are very, very strange, but I will concede that any time there's a sudden shift in somebody's behavior before they go missing, obviously that's something that needs to be considered when you're entertaining the different theories. I will also point out again that his sister did say that he would often stop paying his phone bill because he'd run out of minutes and he just didn't want to pay for it anymore, or he would break his phone, so he was pretty much always just getting a new phone. He, again, would often buy used phones from somebody else who had already paid them off so that he's not left with that kind of phone bill. I think it's possible that if he was going through something in his life or his mental health that he wouldn't want to tell anybody and that, you know, maybe he got a new phone and didn't tell anybody about it and police don't even know, so he's doing things on his phone and there is activity, but they just don't know because there's no phone connected to his name and he basically uses his phone by buying minutes. I also will say that there are a lot of cases, almost most cases that we cover here, where the friends and family of the person who went missing are like, he or she would have told me if something was going on. They didn't show any signs of stress or distress or anything else before they went missing, etc, etc. But that is not the case here. People who know him know that if he was going through something, he wouldn't mention it. If he was asked, he wouldn't lie and he might have told them at that point, but otherwise, he would have kept it to himself. A friend of Marshall's also did say that if he did go missing on his own accord, that he doesn't think it's unreasonable that he wouldn't have contacted anybody. He honestly thinks that if he did go missing and he chose to go missing and he's still out there, that, you know, he probably wouldn't want to contact anybody and he probably wouldn't want anybody to know where he is. I will say that if him and Paige are as close as it seems like they were, maybe her moving to Hawaii affected him a lot more than he let on. I can say personally that I moved across the country away from my sister, who I'm very close to, and I could see that we weren't talking as often after I moved, and it doesn't mean that we don't miss each other and that we're not as close as we used to be, it's just different. People have a lot of things in their lives that are going on, whether it just be normal things like, you know, work or if you have children or just visiting with friends or just anything that you're doing in your day-to-day -day life that makes it difficult to contact somebody who lives states away from you. I can also see how that lack of contact can make somebody feel lonely or isolated or disconnected from that person. Once again, they can still be close. They can still visit each other twice a year and still have the greatest time when they're together. And he could know deep down that, you know, this person still cares about me. My sister still cares about me. But it gets to a point, if he's anything like me, where you start feeling like, maybe you're not as connected to that person. And again, you know deep down that that's not true, but those are the things that you start telling yourself. If you're in a point where you really feel disconnected from the rest of your family because you moved away, you can know that they love you, but you can also feel like there's just this distance between you and you don't really know what to do. I can see a lot of myself in Marshall, which is why I can sort of feel like I understand if he was going through some sort of mental, you know, state, I can kind of understand why. We know that he had a lot of friends. We know that he had a very good circle of friends, but when you move and when you get busy, it's really hard to keep in touch with your friends. So again, you can know deep down that they care about you, but if you're in a state where you just don't really know what to do with your life and you kind of feel like you're not contacting anybody and nobody's contacting you, it can really start to affect your mental health and it feels like you have no friends and it feels like you have nobody in your corner even if you do. So I can see how he might have gotten to a point where he just knows he's so far away from everybody and he just doesn't know what to do with his life so he just decides, why don't I just start a new one? Especially if he was really struggling in school and he was was struggling to find his place in the world and he really didn't want to disappoint his family and he didn't want them to know, 
I can see how this would be a thought that he had. This could have gone any number of ways, but I can definitely see that this is a possible scenario for how he went missing. If he was searching on his new phone that nobody knew about, you know, about these reclusive areas and hikes he could go on and desolate rural places that he could park his car in, it wouldn't show up on his history because, you know, police haven't searched that device. So, I can definitely see that he would want to find the most random spot where he knew he didn't have connections, where he knew his family would not search for him so that, you know, he could go missing and nobody would find him. But the one thing that really sticks out to me about all of this is the fact that he burned his truck. If he had just parked his car in that area and just left it there, chances are nobody would have reported it until weeks later. Somebody may have reported it if they noticed that it was sitting there for several weeks, but because it had been burned, it was reported right away because obviously that draws a lot of attention. We don't know exactly how long the car was sitting there, but we do know that it couldn't have been more than five days because he was last seen on the 17th and we know that he was in Lethbridge on the 18th. So we know it couldn't have been there for more than five days before it was reported. So if he wants to stay hidden, why draw attention by burning the crap out of your truck? Plus, what would the reasoning be? If he didn't want certain things to be found, he could have just taken them with him or burned those specific items or buried them somewhere. So really, this is something in this case that I genuinely do not understand. I will also say that his roommate said that before he went missing, you know, he didn't show any sort of signs of being in distress. He did spend a lot of time in his room, but that was totally normal for him. He helped out around the house. He was very pleasant to be around. And so there was nothing out of the ordinary that anybody noticed from him. I want to mention the roommate thing because those are the people that see him every single day. So if there was more of a shift in his behavior, they might notice it before his family who don't see him every day. So they don't think that there was any shift in his behaviors, but again, if he didn't want to tell anybody, they may not have noticed. The next theory is that something happened to Marshall. It was said that Lethbridge is one of the more dangerous cities in Canada. It's known for a lot of crime and drug activity and things like that. So his family wonders if he maybe got caught up in the wrong crowd. We know that he's this sweet, calm guy who doesn't want to cause waves, so his family thinks that if he did get caught up with something, that he wouldn't be the person to confront anybody or fight his way out. He might just go along with certain things for the sake of not wanting to make waves. Maybe he agreed to drive with somebody or let them use his truck or something like that, and something happened where things turned bad and they harmed him. Or maybe it could have been a situation simply of a carjacking gone wrong. Maybe the person attempted to steal Marshall's truck and then he fought back and he was killed in his truck. That would make sense to me for why his truck was driven out to a completely random area where nobody would think to look for Marshall and why it was burned so badly. This person could have thought that if they burned it bad enough that they wouldn't be able to connect the truck back to Marshall because, you know, any evidence, you know, his license plate, things like that would be gone. Obviously, it was connected back to him, but that could have been the mindset of the person who did this to him. If the perpetrator was familiar with the area where the truck was found and he knew that it wasn't frequented very often and he knew that there was limited cell service there, maybe that's why this person parked the car there. Obviously, if this person somehow knew that he had no connections to the area, then that means that it could have been somebody that he knew. So, I think with this theory, it's possible that it could have been somebody that he knew or it could have been a random perpetrator. Then, obviously, we know that the reason for burning the truck would be to get rid of any evidence that he was harmed in that truck whether there was blood in there or the person was worried about their DNA being found or their fingerprints or something. It makes more sense that if a crime was committed in the truck, that that's why somebody would burn it to avoid anything being found within the truck. Now, again, we know that his cell phone, wallet, laptop, and his backpack and other personal belongings were all taken. So that can point to the fact that maybe he took them with him when he left. 
Or it could mean that all of these items were within the backpack and that this person knew that his personal belongings that could identify him would be in the backpack. So whoever did this to him got rid of the stuff along with his body if they did kill him. I think that it could have happened where he was harmed and then he was buried somewhere and they buried his personal belongings along with him and then drove this truck and started frantically looking through it to see if they missed anything or anything like that and then in all of the stress of this they determined that it was just easier to burn the truck or something like that and then that's why the items were all thrown out and that's why the truck was burnt and then in terms of the passport being found the expired passport I think it could be possible that this person just didn't notice that the passport was in there and through the mess of trying to you know go through the stuff and throwing things around looking to see if they left anything behind they simply didn't notice that the passport was there because again, you wouldn't think that there'd be random IDs and things like that just laying around in someone's truck. You would think that all of their, you know, identification would be on their person or in their backpack or something like that. So it's totally possible that this person threw the passport out there and didn't even notice that it got thrown. Or Maybe there was evidence of communication between this person and Marshall on his devices. So this person needed to make sure that these items were gone before the truck was found. And, you know, he again buried them with his body or dumped them in a lake or something like that. Or this person still has them. And then obviously when they see this expired passport, they know that, you know, this has nothing to do with the crime that just took place. There's no evidence on it we don't really need it. With the things being thrown around his truck, I really don't get why Marshall, if he left, why he would throw all those things out of his truck before burning it. Maybe he wanted to come back to them someday and when they realized that his truck was found, he just decided to leave them there. Maybe he was the person who came back to the scene and, you know, reorganized because he wanted to take some of the things that he threw out of his truck. I don't really know, but I really don't get why Marshall himself would have thrown all of those things around his truck instead of just taking them with him. I also think that if we're gonna say there was a change in his mental state, I think that could also point towards a big change in his life. Maybe he was acting differently because he got himself into some sort of trouble or involved with people that he shouldn't have and that's what caused him to become more withdrawn. Maybe his mental state was already declining and that caused him to seek drugs like weed or something like that. And because of him visiting, you know, maybe he went to sketchy areas to get the drugs or something like that and he was carjacked or he got involved in the wrong people. I don't think that his mental state being off should be purely dismissed as him wanting to leave or take his own life. I think that a change in behavior can point towards a lot of things, not just that he was depressed and wanted to leave his life. After talking through both scenarios, I can see how both of these situations could be possible and I could also see how something else could be possible. I think the biggest things that need to be paid attention to in this case is the location of his truck. Did any of his friends or acquaintances or anywhere else have connections to that area? We also need to pay attention to the fact that his truck was burned as bad as it was. These are things that I think are huge aspects to this case that can definitely give us more answers. I also wish we knew more about the time that he spent at the storage locker. It could tell us a lot or it could mean almost nothing. Maybe he met up with people at the storage unit who would later harm him. Maybe he needed something out of the storage unit or needed to put or hide something in the storage unit because of people that he was involved with. We really don't know. We do know that police don't think that there's a reason to do DNA testing or fingerprint testing. But we also know that there's a lot of information that hasn't been released to the public or to the family for the sake of keeping the integrity of the investigation. But in my opinion, I do think that there could be enough evidence here to point that something could have happened. So those are pretty much the main theories in this case. I truly don't know which way I lean or what I believe. I find myself leaning both ways. When I was talking about him wanting to leave his life, I was like, obviously that's what happened. Obviously he left his life. And then when I'm talking about him being the victim of foul play, I'm like, obviously he was the victim of something here. That's what we need to look into. So 
this could go both ways in my opinion, but I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you guys think about this information. But at the end of the day, I think this case could be solved just by spreading more awareness about Marshall and his case, and hopefully somebody who knows something might be able to come forward with what they know. Marshall Iwasha was 26 years old when he went missing on November 17th, 2019. He is 5 feet 11 inches tall, weighing 170 pounds with brown shoulder length curly hair. He was last seen wearing a green hoodie, gray hat, black pants, and red high top shoes. If you have any information regarding Marshall's disappearance, please contact the Calgary Police at 403-266-1234 or the Pemberton RCMP or the Lethbridge Police. Both numbers will be listed down below. I do also want to mention that the family has created a Facebook group where you can stay up to date on Marshall's case or anything else that you want to find out. So, if you do want to keep following the case, I highly suggest you check out their Facebook page. They are still active on it. They're still posting. They're still talking about him and his case and still keeping his memory alive. Again, I truly think that just by spreading this case as far as and wide as we can, it does have the potential to be solved. So, if you know anything, if you know absolutely anything, like literally the smallest amount of information, it could be exactly the piece that police needed to finally solve this case. So, if you do know anything, please come forward and contact any of the sources that I have listed below. But with that, that is all I have for today's video. I'm really looking forward to hearing what you guys think in the comments. Do you think that he left on his own accord? Do you think something happened to him or do you think that something else is at play here? Please let me know your thoughts and theories in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Make sure you turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter and Instagram, both will be linked down below, and if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please submit those suggestions using the Google form that I have listed down below. I find that to be a much more streamlined way of getting these case suggestions to me, so make sure you use my form down below if you have any cases that you would like to see covered on this channel. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.